neighbors in New Jersey, Michigan, California, Louisiana. Uh, in terms of how we're operating, how we're managing the situation, as we know, the hospital system basically has is a three-legged stool. It relies on number of beds, number of staff, uh, and the equipment. Number of beds, we have started with a system of about 53,000 beds statewide. We're up to about 90,000 available beds, so we have more than enough beds available. Uh, staff has been a problem. Staffing, st healthcare staff is getting sick. Uh, they're overworked, they're stressed, they're under great emotional stress. You know, think about these healthcare workers. You're working in a hospital, in an emergency room that's overwhelmed. Uh, you're worried about your own health. You then go home, you're worried about uh, bringing a virus home if you're infected. At home is under stress, as every home is under stress. About 7,000 new staff have been hired from the pool that we have identified. These are retired healthcare workers who came forward. These are people from across the country who came forward. The state has a pool of potential employees. The hospitals hire from that pool and they've hired about 7,000 to date. Equipment, that's the protective equipment. Uh, ventilators, where uh, we, are, we are stretching and moving, but uh, every hospital has what they need to date. And then we balance the patient load among all hospitals, so no hospital, single hospital or system gets overburdened. And that's a daily adjustment, which takes uh, tremendous uh, cooperation among all of the healthcare institutions. I thank them very much for what they're doing. And then we have the overload relief, which is the Javits Center, 2,500 beds, and uh, the U.S. Navy Ship Comfort. The U.S. Navy Ship Comfort had 1,000 bed capacity. It was originally for non-COVID patients. What wound up happening was we don't really have non-COVID patients. Close down society, there's fewer traffic accidents, crime is down. So the original plan, which was the comfort would take non-COVID cases from the hospitals, didn't really work because the hospitals didn't have non-COVID cases. Uh, I called the president yesterday morning, asked him to speak to the uh, Department of Defense to see if they would change it to COVID. President, to his credit, uh, moved expeditiously, uh, called me back yesterday afternoon, said they would make the comfort non-COVID. Uh, COVID, when they make that transition, the capacity of the ship comes down from 1,000 to 500 beds uh, because COVID patients require a greater treatment area, more space, and therefore, the capacity of the ship came down from 1,000 to 500. It's still a tremendous benefit. So between Javits and the Comfort, that's 3,000 beds, which is a welcome overload relief to the hospital system, which is already extraordinarily stressed. But I spoke to General Shaughnessy today, uh, who we spoke through the Comfort and Javits. The, Department of Defense has been fantastic, and the number of military personnel they have sent up here and how quickly they've sent up here, and this is a tough assignment to run facilities this large and to come up to speed and to be handling this many COVID patients in a new startup emergency facility. This is a really uh, difficult undertaking, and they have been, they've really been fantastic, and I want to thank them all. And I want to thank the president for moving as quickly as he did. We're working on a tri-state cooperative. As I mentioned, I spoke to Governor Murphy from New Jersey. I spoke to Governor Ned Lamont from the state of Connecticut. We coordinated the shutting down, if you will, when we did schools, businesses, et cetera, because this really operates as a tri-state area. A lot of people who live in New Jersey, uh, work in New York, or live in New York, work in New Jersey or Connecticut. So we talk about the tri-state area, which is true. And we try to operate to the best we can as that regional 
collaboration, and that has been working well for us on schools, on the economy, on health care issues. We have to start planning restarting life. We're not there yet, but uh, this is not a light switch that we can just flick one day and everything goes back to normal. We're going to have to restart that economy. We're going to have to restart a lot of systems that we shut down abruptly. And we need to start to plan for that. And I spoke to the governors, Governor Murphy and Governor Lamont, about coming up with a regional, metropolitan, tri-state uh, approach to do just that. How do we, when we get to that point, which we're not at, but how do we restart our economy and get everything up and running as quickly as possible? My personal opinion is going to come down to how good we are with testing. Uh, you're not going to end the infection and end the virus uh, before you start restarting life. I don't think you have that luxury. How do you start the economy back up? How do you start getting back to work as quickly as possible? It's going to come down to testing. You're going to have to know who had the virus, who resolved the virus, who never had it, and that's going to be testing. And that is an entirely new field that we're just developing now, right? Uh, new York State developed, a Department of Health developed an antibody testing regimen that Department of Health has approved for uh, use in New York State. That has to be brought to scale, and the Department of Health is going to be working with the FDA to do just that. This tests uh, the blood to determine whether or not you have the antibodies, which means you had the virus and resolved the virus. That's why you would have the antibodies for the virus. That would mean that you're no longer contagious uh, and you can't catch the virus because you have the antibodies in your system, which means you can get to work, you can go back to school, you can do whatever you want. Uh, but you have to have that testing, and you have to have that testing on a scale, right? You have 19 million people in the state of New York. Just think of how many people you would need to be able to test and test quickly. So the antibody testing is part of that. Uh, also, rapid testing to determine whether or not you have the virus now exists. They have, quote, unquote, 15-minute tests that are commercially available. But again, they have to be brought to scale. Uh, no private company has the capacity to bring those to scale. So I was speaking with Governor Murphy uh, and Governor Lamont. Uh, we are interested in working with private companies that can actually in bring this testing capacity to scale and to scale quickly. Because, again, if you have the antibody testing, that's part. If you can then test if a person is positive for the virus and you can do it that day and you can get those results in 15 minutes, uh, that's also another way to get back to life and do it quickly. So uh, we're very interested in that in New York. So is New Jersey. So is Connecticut. These, there are private companies that have these tests. Again, it's all up to scale. We're starting them in the state of New York, but we only have about a 50,000-person testing capacity, which is nice, but uh, it's not of a scale that's actually going to make a large difference. So private companies that are interested in getting into this space and coming up to scale quickly, we are interested in those companies, and we're interested in investing in those companies. Uh, and they should contact us at Empire State Development Corporation. The also restarting life, the state budget, not just this state, but uh, every state budget has been decimated by this situation. You shut down the economy. People aren't working. They're not paying income taxes. Businesses aren't operating. So our budget just collapsed, right? Our revenues just collapsed. Uh, you want to restart the economy. You have to help restart the local governments, and that's going to be a federal act. Uh, I don't have the capacity as a governor, no governor does, to generate revenue in a positive way from an economy that's not operating. 
that is going to be a federal stimulus bill. Uh, there's no other way to do this. And it has to be a stimulus bill that actually understands you have state and local governments that have to be brought up to speed and functioning if you want to facilitate this restarting of the economy. Federal government passed some legislation. Uh, as I've said uh, at the time, it was woefully inadequate from New York's point of view. We then have had some time to actually study the legislation. It actually gets worse when you read it. Uh, and it's not even what was represented to us initially. So I'm sending our congressional delegation a letter today uh, saying uh, the past legislation uh, did good for the nation. I have no doubt gave aid to a lot of people and places that needed it. But it was not fair to New York. Uh, and that has to be remedied in any legislation that goes forward. The last point, I know it's been a frustrating 37 days, but it's only been 37 days, on the other hand. I know it feels like a lifetime. It's been so disruptive, uh, so abrupt, so frightening, so disorienting, but it's only been 37 days, right? Everything in context and everything in perspective. Uh, I know it's tough to get up every day, and this is like Groundhog Day, living through this bizarre reality that we're in. Uh, it's even more difficult, I think, with the weather changing, and you feel the seasons changing, and it's getting nicer, and uh, you start to open a new book of possibilities, and uh, you know now the weather's getting nice, and I should be getting outdoors, and I should be doing this, and I should be doing this. I get it. But it's only been 37 days. And I started by saying those numbers of cases, that's not arbitrary. What we do affects the number of cases. Our behavior affects the number of cases. We're generating the cases. They're not descending on us from heaven, right? It's our behavior. So it's been 37 days. The 1918 pandemic that we talk about peaked in New York for six months. It came through in three waves, and it peaked for six months. 30,000 people died in New York during that pandemic. Why? They didn't react the way we did. They didn't know as much as we know today. They didn't have the same drug therapies. But we are changing the curve in that, in that virus growth. You see that plateauing. That's because of what we are doing. If we don't do what we are doing, that is a much different curve. And that's what happened in the past. So social distancing is working. Well, you shut down all the businesses. I know. Well, you shut down all the schools. I know, but it is working. That's why you see those numbers coming down. If we were doing the same rate of interaction, those numbers would still be going up. So to the extent we see a flattening or a possible plateau, that's because of what we are doing, and we have to keep doing it. I know it's hard, but uh, we have to keep doing it. And to the extent it takes uh, an effort, remember at this time, it's not a, it is about we, and it is not about me. I know what I would like to be doing. I would like to be going, uh, it's motorcycle weather for me. It's time to get out on the water. It's time to go hiking in the Adirondacks. I get it, it's not about me. It's not about me. What I do will affect other people. It will affect my family. It will affect other people. It will affect people in those emergency rooms who are killing themselves every day to keep other people safe. I get infected, I will affect them. So we all talk about society and community and interconnection and interrelation and family and life is bigger than us. Now is the time to live that, right? 
Now is the time to live that. So when you feel that need, I have to do this. It's not about me. It's about we and what's good for all of us. And my health is in your hands. And your health is in my hands. And the health of those health care workers and those first responders and all those people who have to show up to work every day to keep society functioning, we are responsible to them also. Uh, so to the extent it's hard, I get it. But uh, maybe if we think about it through a different lens, a broader lens, it'll be a little easier. So let's not get complacent. We have to stay disciplined, we have to stay smart, we have to stay safe, and we do that by staying at home, and we will get through that, through this, together. Questions? The president said yesterday that the comfort is meant to treat uh, trauma patients and that they could isolate COVID patients in a small number. I know you said that they are going to be um, treating a smaller number of patients, but, you know, what, you know, will the ship be able to care for you know, even that number of COVID patients safely? The, I spoke to General Shaughnessy, I spoke to the President, I spoke to the Vice President, and I spoke to Northwell, who's helping manage the uh, comfort. Uh, when you transition from non-COVID patients to COVID, the capacity of the ship goes from 1,000 beds down to 500 beds, but it can treat 500 COVID patients adequately and safely, and that's what we're transitioning into operation now. What's going on the antibody test? Like, if Dr. Zerbe, you about the antibody tomorrow, test? What, like, how long is it going to take you at any of your So we, we have a test at our Wadsworth lab that we have developed. Uh, we're working to scale that up now. Um, over the course of the next week, we'll be able to figure out uh, how many we can run. We're expecting to be able to scale that up, not just here in the lab, in our, our lab, but to get other labs to do as well. That's where we'll have to work with the FDA to get that approved. The FDA has already approved some private antibody tests. Is there a way that the state can work with them, or? So I think that antibody tests are, are, you have to look at them. Some antibody tests measure the immunoglobulin G, and others measure the immunoglobulin M and G. The difference is that some suggest that there's a new infection occurring, that's the IgM, and others show that the infection's been around for a while. So it's important to make sure that the tests that we are measuring show that individuals had the infection, they aren't develop, have the infection and still, still have the infection. So it's important to make sure it's the correct test. Our test measures the immunoglobulin G saying that they had the infection and it's resolved. Did you get that? Uh, yeah, no, neither did I. Sorry, Do me, you got one more time. I got one more time. <laughs> so this, thank you. So there's multi, many tests that are out there that companies are making. There's two types of immunoglobulins. There's one that says the infection just uh, is still there and you're starting to mount a response, which is, happens with any virus. And other, your body also makes an immunoglobulin after your infection has, is resolved or it's developed, it's resolved. That's the one you want to measure. Otherwise, you may be measuring something which actually says you still have the infection in your body. So you want to measure the one that says it's resolved. And that's the one that we're, we've developed the test for. Is that better? Yes, that was good. Thank you. I almost understood that one. Mark? <laughs> Earlier today, the, this is very provincial. I know you're close to the Jewish community. I'm very provincial, that's okay. But I know that you're very close to the Jewish community. Yes. Uh, earlier today, the Nova Minska Rebbe passed away from coronavirus in Borough Park, and he's going to be buried later today. So this is a, like a right for a, a Buddha Israel says, you know, stay away. You know, it should be small, but you know how people listen. I mean, it, this seems right for a mass gathering. Is there anything that, you, that the state police or state government can do to make sure that people are held at bay? I'm sure the, this is Borough Park, Brooklyn, right? I'm sure the NYPD will be doing what they need to do. I made it clear yesterday that uh, these social distancing regulations are not just pleas. They're regulations. You can be fined for it. We increased the fine to make the point. Uh, that was serious. I'm sure the NYPD will be enforcing it. But also, people have to understand. I understand religious gatherings. I understand the Orthodox community, a Jewish Orthodox community. I'm very close to them, uh, and I have been for many, many years, and my family is very close to them. But now is not the time for large religious gatherings. I mean, we've we paid this price already. We've learned this lesson. 
That was New Rochelle and Westchester. Uh, so please, now is not the time. You do no one, you do no one a service uh, by making this worse and infecting more people. Well, Joseph, there's uh, been a lot of reports that communities of color have been particularly hit hard by the virus. Um, do you have a sense yet if that's been the case in New York? And you know, you've been putting out a lot of data, gender, uh, age updating it daily. Has it been difficult to get those racial breakdowns? And like, what are you doing to get those? So the hospital did, so there has been a lag. We understand people want that information. We want that information too, and we'll have it this week. Is there, is there any sense, though, Dr. Butler, that there has been that trend where it has affected um, the public? So one of the challenges is that uh, some of the communities are, have challenges with their health in general. They're, more apt to have some of the challenges with, with asthma and diabetes. And so anytime anyone who has underlying uh, medical conditions ends up with this virus or any other virus, it puts them more at risk. Do you have any update on the unemployment website? I know Felicity talked yesterday about working with Google. Is there any progress there? There is progress there, and we'll have that new interface up and running by Thursday. And we've actually worked with Verizon. A lot of the problem was the, the lines were crashing. Um, because the volume was so extreme, we've now moved 80% of the incoming calls off of the Verizon system and into call centers, and so you should start to see some easing up on that today. And again, we just ask people to remain patient as we get this resolved. Governor, you promised an executive order on Friday regarding ventilator redistribution, and I believe that that executive order was also going to cover other things. That still hasn't appeared. Is there a reason for the delay? No, I'm going to issue an executive order today on everything that I've mentioned, the fines, et cetera. What, el what else will that cover? That will cover everything we've discussed to date. That's going to be voluntary now. The uh, quote unquote taking the ventilators. That uh, the health uh, association put out something saying it's going to be a voluntary taking of those. Is that yeah, Joseph. It was always the hospitals tell us what they have quote unquote available. Uh, meaning unused, and they're not going to use it in the foreseeable future. So it was always of the equipment that you believe, you hospital believe, is available. If, uh, if the state uh, lent 20% of the available units, as you define available, that would be 500. And 500 ventilators was a big deal, especially two weeks ago. Uh, frankly, since then, other things have happened. We have 1,000 ventilators from China. Uh, California freed up 500 ventilators. Oregon sent 140 ventilators. State of Washington freed up, I think, 400 ventilators or something like that. Uh, we've also acquired an additional 500 ventilators. So we're not in the position that we were in. But that's what it always was. A hospital says we have available, by their own definition, uh, unused inventory, we're not using for the foreseeable future, 20% of that number, leaving them with 80% of the unused, was 500 ventilators. That sounds like a big change from what you were saying on Friday, though. No, that's what I was saying. Governor, would you have a thoughts on getting a presumptive um, line of duty death benefit similar to that that was passed after 9-11 for state and city workers who died of COVID? It's something that uh, I think is going to come up, and I think it's an important thing to look at. I'd also like to find a way to uh, say thank you to these healthcare workers who are out there every day. Uh, you know, we talk to them on the telephone, uh, but actually, what they have done is just incredible. Just incredible. And not just the healthcare workers. I mean, the healthcare workers, just think of the mindset to walk into that ER every morning, putting on these gowns, putting on all this protective uh, clothing, having to change the protective clothing several times a day, seeing people pass away, and then go home and deal with the stress at home. But also the first responders, the transit workers, you look at the rates of sickness, I mean, they know what they're exposing themselves to, and they, they still do it. I mean, just God bless them. Governor, do you have plans to grant clemency to um, a large number of uh, 
uh, are just any inmates in the state prison system to curb this coronavirus? We're looking at that, you know, any way we can, uh, we are, and we're looking at that continually. Uh, I don't think there's anything new on that right now, but it's something we're exploring all the time. Is there any specific plans that you're considering or any specific models? We've done a number, but uh, nothing right now. Are there any new? We've done about 700 parole violators statewide. Those are people who were deemed to be low risk to public safety um, and also high risk to COVID. And so we have done that so far, and we're continuing to evaluate it on an ongoing so basis. I think the, the promise was about 400 people to come out of Rikers. So far, that's been about 130 people have been released. Is, is there a I reason for the lag? I think we've done about 240 out of Rikers so far of the 700 statewide. But we can get you the exact number, that's Jesse. Fresh and, and Governor, on a more kind of psychological, philosophical issue, 730 people died. It, it, these numbers keep rolling out. But they're, uh, it, it's easy, it would seem, to get numb to these sorts of, uh, you know, stats. Um, how, do, how do you counter that? How do you impress on people that these are human lives, that this is a, an enormous human catastrophe? You know, Jesse, if they, uh, I hear the point. I guess one could get numb to the numbers. That's why I said, remember, every number is a, uh, a human being behind that and a family. Uh, for myself, I can tell you, uh, the last thing I do is get numb. Uh, I can tell you for the hospital staff that goes through this, they're not getting numb. For the families who are suffering, they're not getting numb. Uh, the pain is increasing. The grief is increasing. I mean, you see those pictures on TV of uh, getting to a situation where you have to put bodies in, in trucks in parking lots. I mean, how you could get numb to any of this. Uh, I, just, I, I, can't, I can't imagine, especially New Yorkers, that we lose the humanity of this. It's something I struggle with every day. I try to think of the opposite, that you know, we are doing good because you can't stop, you can't stop uh, you can't save everyone. This virus is very good at what it does, and it kills vulnerable people. That's what it does. And it does that very well. And we can't stop that. The question is, are you saving everyone you can save? And there the answer is yes, and I take some solace in that fact. Uh, our health care system is operating. When I, I don't believe we lost a single person because we couldn't provide care. People we lost, we couldn't save despite our best efforts. Uh, but no, I don't, I, don't see, I don't see the numbness, and I don't believe New Yorkers see the numbness. I think the frustration of an individual situation can cause you to do irresponsible things, uh, to go out, to uh, go out more than you should, to disregard social distancing. I think that's that's an issue, uh, and that's what I've been trying to address. Yet, but when people do eventually start getting back to work, will it be the reverse of the reduction, meaning they'll go back in sorts of 25 percent of the time, or 12, or something yeah. like that? I don't know. It's a good question. I think they go back, as my opinion, it's not a fact. I think, and it's a, we're working on a plan with uh, Connecticut and New Jersey, because when we go back, we go back together. Uh, I think it, we go back with people who have tested that they are negative, or people who have tested that they have the antibodies, which means they had the virus and they're immune from the virus. Uh, or we go back with younger people going first, still protecting, isolating the vulnerable. But if it's waves, I think those are the waves. Is there any proof you can't get reinfected by, if you have the antibodies? Is there Let's ask that? Dr. Zucker, your friend. So there, usually when you have a virus, you develop antibodies, you don't get it again. Uh, there was one report out of China where they suggested that maybe there were some cases, but that hasn't been uh, 
confirmed yet. Are you concerned that the temporary hospitals will be accepting significant numbers of patients until after the peak is passed? A large number of what, I'm sorry? Are you concerned that the temporary hospitals won't be accepting significant numbers of patients until after the peak is passed? A significant number of patients? patients? Mm -hmm. No, they're ramping up now. The Javits Center and, and the uh, Comfort you're talking about? Yes, the the Javits and Comfort, well, there's two separate situations. When I say we have about 90,000 bed capacity, we brought online additional beds, right? Uh, two ways. Number one, every hospital had to increase capacity by 50% with a goal of 100%. Every hospital has increased capacity 50%. That's why you see hospital beds in conference rooms and lobbies, et cetera. Second, we built temporary emergency facilities, primarily, primarily around downstate New York. They may or not, may not be used depending on whether or not we need the beds. The Javits and the Comfort we are using, and they're ramping up now. I'm going to speak to the hospitals. Thank you. All right, Governor Andrew Cuomo of New York uh, on Tuesday, just moments ago, if you were watching this press conference, uh, reiterating uh, the state of play here in the state of New York, uh, recording the largest single day increase in death, the total number of dead uh, here in New York State, uh, 5,489. 5, uh, 5, but there was a glimmer uh, from the governor of New York uh, saying that it does appear uh, that things seem to be uh, flattening out, for lack of a better word, uh, that the number of, 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 of deaths, um, while it we have recorded a, a very large one, a single largest single day increase uh, that the social distancing um, and other measures that the officials, New York officials have put into place are having uh, some of an effect. We'll have to see how that plays out uh, over the days and weeks ahead. Uh, so uh, the news out of New York from Governor Andrew Cuomo, uh, to the extent the governor said that we see a flattening or a possible plateau, that is because, Governor Cuomo is saying, of what we are doing and we have to keep doing it. All right, we're going to take a quick break. More news on the other side of that break. Stick around. You're streaming CBSN. You can watch CBSN 24-7 got an amazing story to share with you. Let's talk about the latest developments. There's so many levels to this. We have a CBS News exclusive. Fires in California. What happens next and how does it all play out? We are on a mission with NASA. I understand you have some breaking news. It's not over yet is the bottom line. This is a massive operation. It's quite an adventure here at CBSN. It's been a day. story means going where the story is how did you get rescued listening when people are hurting getting to the heart of what matters wow that's who nora is that's what nora does the cbs evening news with nora o'donnell from washington dc Good morning to you and welcome to CBS This Morning. Understanding the world. We're going to begin with breaking news. Begins with the right questions. Have police discovered a motive? Does the president have a red line here? What can voters there expect to see today? Join Gail King, Anthony Mason, and Tony DeCopo on CBS This Morning. We know a little more this morning. This is a major development. This is a very serious situation. More news every morning on the show everyone is talking about. We have much more news ahead for you. CBS This Morning. The biggest names in politics. Whoa, and that's news. We're all of the president's security advisors in full agreement. Face the questions you want answered. Are we at a tipping point? Can you walk the American people through what happens next? Oh, no, that's a great question. Good question. Are you saying you did not ever hear of such a deal? Face the Nation with Margaret Brennan. 
What's new under the sun? Good morning. I'm Jane Pauley, and this is Sunday Morning. Experience thought-provoking, innovative, and truly original reporting. Hey, Jane. Because there's always something new under the sun. Please join us when our trumpet sounds again on CBS Sunday Morning. Telling the whole story means going where the story is. How did you get rescued? Listening when people are hurting. Sorry. Getting to the heart of what matters. Wow. That's who Nora is. That's what Nora does. The CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell from Washington, D.C. The funeral industry is struggling to keep up with the rapidly increasing death toll caused by the coronavirus pandemic. Already, around 11,000 people have died from the virus in the United States, and tens of thousands more lives are projected to be lost. The numbers have created an unprecedented bottleneck at morgues, funeral homes, and cemeteries. And Graham Kate spoke to several funeral directors in New York City, which is the epicenter uh, of this outbreak here in the U.S. And Graham, you're joining us now. You know, Graham, I remember, I think maybe it was last week or a week ago, the president talking about uh, Elmer's Hospital in Queens that he was really familiar with. And he saw a video of what he described as body bags uh, lying in the hallway and uh, freezer trucks coming in because of a morgue overflow. And you could really tell that he was rattled by those images. But after those body bags leave the hospital, they have to go to area morgues, they have to go to area funeral homes. How are morgues and funeral homes in New York coping? They're overflowing. Think of funeral directors as the end of the front line in terms of those who have to directly interact with people who have caught the virus and who could still potentially pass it on through like respiratory microbes. Uh, and they're saying we have more cases than we can handle. And just like in the hospitals, we're running short on personal protective equipment. And and, and they point out, you know, funeral directors are, are going to be the last in the line of those frontline workers to get that equipment because it's so important to get it to medical workers first. Hmm. Uh, and Graham, uh, funeral homes are also enforcing social distancing. How is that changing the nature of what they do? One said to me that the business model has completely changed. Uh, in many cases, the bodies are going straight to a crematorium or straight to a grave without there being any chance for loved ones to be able to go and pay their respects in the way we think of, like standing in front of a casket and, and taking the time there. And then in other cases, when there is able to be a service at a funeral home, um, there are these kind of strict rules that have been put into place. Maybe it's shifts, so four or five people can come at a time, and then the next four or five people. And it all has to be very orderly um, and very supervised. And then, of course, there are, there are virtual services, so that's people gathering over Zoom or FaceTime, but not getting to do that personal uh, uh, service that, that we're used to seeing. And for the funeral directors, they said that's actually really hard. They, they, they pride themselves. You don't get into the the funeral business if you're not trying to give people like a really good chance to grieve in the way that we've come to expect. And right now they have to say to people, we can't do it the way maybe you expected to be able to do it for this person or that person may have hoped to have had, but we have to make the best of it right now. 
Yeah, I think it's a really good point to bring up, Graham, that for funeral directors, you know, sort of managing and taking care of the body is one thing, but they also really, really focus on being supportive, of being honorable, of, of sort of stepping in when, you know, perhaps a family is falling apart and being a steadying, stabilizing force. And I, and much of that has to do with probably, you know, sort of being intimate, touching someone, hugging them when they need a hug, giving them a handkerchief when they're crying, and they can't do any of that stuff. And then there is just sort of the basic kind of, um, uh, um, like I said, managing the bodies, but sort of the basic things that you need to do, like finding a place for the body to go. Cemetery plots. Are there enough cemetery plots? So I don't actually have a number on the number of cemetery plots in New York, but what we do know is that they're coming in so fast that yesterday, for instance, they were talking about well, we have to create temporary internment sites. And there was some argument between officials about whether that'll happen. New York City actually has an island that over, over the course of about two centuries, they've used as like a potter's field. And this would be the first time that um, it's not just for like unidentified people, they would be talking about using that for just the overflow of bodies. And of course, there's been some argument about whether or not the city's actually considering that, but you did have multiple officials um, saying that, look, in, in the long run, this is a plan that we've always had and we've just never actually had to implement before. And then when you talk about for where there are funeral services, these guys are all exhausted. They're saying, we're not even sleeping because it's just funeral after funeral after funeral. And we want to make sure that we can do it as right as we can. And that takes time. Let me ask you, Gran, uh, where are, I mean, funeral directors, uh, people who work at morgues, they are essential services, but where are they in the line to receive protective gear? They say they're at the end of the line, and they say they understand that, right? I, I spoke to the uh, president of the New York State Funeral Directors Association, and he said, I understand that hospital workers and medical employees need the PPE, the personal protective equipment, and he, but he said, we need it too. And we're the last ones to get it. And every, to a T, every funeral director that I spoke to said, I still have some supplies, but I am running low and I can't figure out where I'm going to get the next shipment. You contact the places that sell them and they say, you're now on the list, but there's no estimate for when you might get it. And, and they're kind of relying on their state association to figure out where to get a very large supply of masks and gloves and, and all the, the equipment you see medical personnel wear. And he told me, you know, I, even my normal uh, suppliers are saying, you're not, you're not the, the main priority right now. Wow. Well, Graham, thank you so much. There's so many different ways that this virus uh, impacts the way we live, things that we have taken for granted before. Um, really appreciate your reporting. Thanks. Thank you. So... So the U.S. Surgeon General says that efforts to flatten the curve appear to be making a difference. He's talking about social distancing. He insists it is still very, very crucial and important. And he also says that the country needs to do a much better job when it comes to testing. Uh, Dr. Jerome Adams spoke about this on CBS This Morning. I started off the week uh, telling Americans that this was going to be a really rough week, but I also wanted Americans to understand that when we've dealt with tough times in the past, the country has rallied. And, and what we're seeing now is the country is rallying. We're seeing New York and New Jersey uh, have hospitalizations level off and start to come down. Deaths are starting to uh, slow down and level off. And that's important because it tells us mitigation is working. It tells us what the American people are doing by staying at home by social distancing, by practicing good hygiene, and the 30-day guidelines for America are actually effective, and they will help us get through to the other side of this unfortunate tragedy. Dr. Adams, how, how can we be sure that mitigation is working as well as we hope it to be working when we don't know, to put it plainly, how many Americans actually have this virus because we don't have widespread testing? So to put it more bluntly, how do we know when we're in the clear and we can get back to normal if we don't know how widespread this is? Well, th there are two questions in there, and I'll quickly unpack both of them. The most important thing is that we know mitigation is working because when we look at the curves of Washington and California, we see that they've been very flat, and that's coincident with them instituting aggressive mitigation. We see Italy and Spain uh, down on the downslopes of their curves, coincident with them starting mitigation. So we know mitigation is working. Now, you mentioned testing. 
testing is a concern. Uh, we are going to be at 2 million tests this week, and it's rapidly ramping up with the commercial industry coming on board. We're also seeing more people doing antibody testing. So what I want the American people to know is I've talked with Admiral Drouin. I speak with him every day. He's our testing czar. And he assures me that by the end of this month, we should be uh, not only just doing diagnostic testing, but also having good surveillance testing across the country. Uh, at 2 million people by the end of this week, we're getting really close to South Korea's initial testing surge numbers. And we are, in fact, doing surveillance testing in some parts of the country uh, where they haven't seen a big increase in cases. So uh, we're not there and, yet, but we are moving in course, the right direction. And of course, that surveillance testing is so important. I want to touch on another point of concern, and that is the, the death rate among African Americans. In Louisiana, mm -hmm. we heard the governor say 70 percent of the fatalities are people of color. In Chicago, we heard the mayor say more than 70 percent in that city. Uh, your response to that, and should the CDC or the federal government be tracking this virus demographically to warn people? Well, Absolutely. Uh, the CDC and the federal government should be and are tracking this virus and trying to break it down by different demographic groups so that we can help people understand. But my office, long before COVID-19, has been talking about health equity, has been talking about the need to help people understand when they're at risk and to actually intervene. And when you look at being black in America, number one, uh, people, unfortunately, are more likely to be of low socioeconomic status which makes it harder to social distance. Number two, we know that blacks are more likely to have diabetes, heart disease, lung disease. And I've shared myself personally that I have high blood pressure, that I have heart disease and spent a week in the ICU due to a heart condition, that I actually have asthma and I'm pre-diabetic. And so I represent that legacy of growing up poor and black in America. And I and many black Americans are at higher risk for COVID. It's why we need everyone to so do their part to slow the spread. So, Doctor, I imagine that it's, it's frustrating for you to hear those numbers, 70 percent of the dead in Louisiana, people of color, African Americans. Is there a particular recommendation heart. you have for that community? Uh, my recommendation. Heart. My recommendation is to understand that you are at risk, you are not immune, and, and my recommendation is to all of America that we're really doing this to protect not just ourselves but each other. Every single person who stays at home, whether you're white, black, brown, or yellow, is a person who is not spreading COVID and is a person who can protect their neighbors. When you wear a cloth facial covering, if you go outside, you're doing it to protect your neighbor. Now's, now's really the time for us to come together and say, look, I'm doing this not just for me and my family, but I'm doing this for my community and all the communities across the country. And it is working. We will get through this. We are seeing progress. But America has the power to change the trajectory of this epidemic. The public really needs to keep doing their part. America's top doctor there. For more interviews like this, stream CBS This Morning weekdays at 7 Eastern right here on CBSN. The health minister of uh, the health of British Prime Minister, rather, Boris Johnson, has taken a turn for the worse as he continues to battle COVID-19. We're going to have the latest on his condition after a short break. Keep it right here. You're streaming CBSN. Understanding the world. We're going to begin with breaking news. Begins with the right questions. Have police discovered a motive? Does the president have a red line here? What can voters are expect to see today? More news every morning. This is a major development. This is a very, very serious situation. CBS This Morning. You can watch CBSN 24-7. We've got an amazing story to share with you. Let's talk about the latest developments. There's so many levels to this. We have a CBS News exclusive. Fires in California. What happens next and how does it all play out? We are on a mission with NASA. I understand you have some breaking news. It's not over yet is the bottom line. This is a massive operation. It's quite an adventure here at CBSN. It's been a day. see the desperation in the journey simply by looking at the trail that's left behind. 
So she says she's 17. She looks kind of like she's 12. Said to me, you know, if you tried to do this in New York City, take a picture of a man, you'd break your camera. There's something very, very uncomfortable about this. Today, a white supremacist blends. This area can be the new Silicon Valley. There was not a cot in the warehouse. Not one cot in the warehouse. We're so far deep at this point that there's no turning back. This is a long road ahead. Ah! Telling the whole story means going where the story is. How did you get rescued? Listening when people are hurting. Sorry. Getting to the heart of what matters. Wow. That's who Nora is. That's what Nora does. The CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell from Washington, D.C. Good morning to you and welcome to CBS This Morning. Understanding the world. We're going to begin with breaking news. Begins with the right questions. Have police discovered a motive? Does the president have a red line here? What can voters here expect to see today? Join Gail King, Anthony Mason, and Tony DeCopel on CBS This Morning. We know a little more this morning. This is a major development. This is a very serious situation. More news every morning on the show everyone is talking about. We have much more news ahead for you. CBS This Morning. names in politics. Whoa, that's news. Are we at a tipping point? Face the questions you want answered. Face the Nation with Margaret Brennan. We're starting to see a distrust in scientific evidence and scientific information. How much has YouTube and the internet complicated science communication? You've provided a platform that anybody can put their information out there. Evolution, global warming, why do people deny science? YouTube was the catalyst for most of this. The Bible describes the world we live in. Evolution describes a world we don't live in. Is there a national standard for science instruction in this country? No. There are 50 states with 50 sets of science standards. Who here believes in evolution? to see you. It's a Tuesday and I'm Anne-Marie Green alongside uh, Vladimir Dutier and we are coming to you from our home studios. That is right, Anne-Marie. It's great, of course, to be with you and our viewers. We thank you so much for uh, being with us and tracking all of the latest developments and we have a lot. There is reason for hope this morning as early evidence suggests good news coming out of New York. The state has been hit especially hard by the coronavirus, but now officials say the number of new hospitalizations is declining. Yeah, but we still have a long way to go. Uh, more than 368,000 people nationwide have tested positive with COVID-19, and the virus has claimed 11,000 American lives. Carly, or rather, Riley Carlson has the latest. A crew member on the Navy ship Comfort has tested positive for COVID-19 just days after docking in New York. The Navy said it will not affect the hospital ship's mission. The news comes just hours after President Trump authorized the Comfort to treat people with the coronavirus. Hopefully uh, that will be uh, very helpful to both states. The Comfort was meant to take on other patients, but the governors of New Jersey and New York said they needed the beds. We don't need the Comfort for non COVID cases. The death toll has slowed in New York, but Governor Andrew Cuomo is still extending the state's stay-at-home order until April 29th. Well, the numbers look like they may be turning. Yay, it's over. 
No, it's not. Members of the White House Coronavirus Task Force are optimistic the national death toll may end up lower than forecasted. I don't accept every day that we're going to have to have 100 to 200,000 deaths. President Trump said he was saddened to hear British Prime Minister Boris Johnson is now in intensive care. Americans are all praying for his recovery. He's been a really good friend. Johnson has been battling the coronavirus for nearly two weeks. Stay at home, folks. A spokesperson said the 55-year-old entered the ICU as a precaution should he require ventilation. The Prime Minister is in safe hands with a brilliant team. Foreign Secretary Dominic Raab has been designated to take over if needed. There's a an incredibly strong team spirit behind the Prime Minister. Johnson last appeared in public on Thursday to clap in support of British health care workers. Riley Carlson, CBS News. Meanwhile, President Trump is downplaying the results of an inspector general's report. The IG report found that hospitals are being hampered by a delay in COVID-19 test results and also a hospital personnel not getting the protective gear that they need. So Ben Tracy is standing by at the White House. Ben, we actually spoke to you about this report yesterday, but now we're hearing from the president. How's he reacting? Well, he's basically dismissing the substance of that report that shows this critical, these critical supplies at hospitals are running low and focusing much more on the politics of it, saying that our politics involved in this report. He, he was asked about this at the White House yesterday at the press briefing, and he said, well, who is this inspector general? Uh, which administration were they appointed under? Do you think politics are a part of this? So this all kind of falls back on the president's real distaste for inspector generals across the government. Keep in mind, it was just last Friday that the president fired the inspector general of the intelligence community. That was the person that handled the whistleblower report that was sent to Congress that became central to the president's impeachment. So the president tends to view people in these positions as members of the deep state, especially if they are delivering information that he does not like. So, Ben, uh, after weeks of grim numbers, officials seem uh, now to be sharing some cautious optimism that there might be hope on the horizon. Uh, has the nation been making progress when it comes to flattening the curve? Yeah, perhaps a little bit of good news. The numbers in hot spots like New York and New Jersey seem to be flattening out over the last couple of days. The governors there say it's probably still too early uh, to tell to see if this is a real flattening of the curve or if this is just something temporary. But we heard some real cautious optimism from the podium here at the White House from Dr. Anthony Fauci yesterday. Uh, basically saying he is seeing encouraging signs and he thinks we might be able to hit below those models that were showing anywhere from 100,000 to 240,000 Americans dying by August from coronavirus. He is now seeing signs that he's hopeful perhaps we'll come in under that if we can flatten this curve faster than we thought. And he attributes that to social distancing, saying Americans are doing it and it's working. I want to ask you, Ben, about a New York Times report that uh, that it indicated that a White House advisor, Peter Navarro, actually warned the president and the White House about the devastating impact of the coronavirus in January, and he sort of rose, uh, he kind of rang alarm bells a, a couple of times. This would have been around the same time that the president was reassuring the American people that the coronavirus was basically under control. There were only a handful of cases, and there was nothing to worry about. Yeah, so there was a lot happening in this particular time frame. This report says that Navarro wrote up two memos, one at the end of January and then one towards the end of February, which now seem very prescient, basically warning that a lot of Americans were going to die, that there was going to be a shortage of personal protective gear, and that the government really had to be prepared for this, both in terms of stockpiling supplies, but also uh, warning that it was going to take a whole lot of money from Congress to offset what this might do to the economy. All of that has now come true. Uh, the timing of it is interesting. So Navarro apparently wrote the first memo on January 29th. That's the same day the president uh, formed the coronavirus task force. But at the time, there was still this disconnect because the president was also, as you mentioned, downplaying the impact of this, saying soon cases will be zero. This really isn't going to be a problem here. And he was kind of resting on his laurels of having shut off uh, travel from China, thinking perhaps that was enough and the only thing he had to do. Uh, it, it's not clear if the president read this memo from Peter Navarro. We will have to ask the president that today at the briefing and see what he says. It is interesting that Peter Navarro is a trade advisor. He's not at all uh, kind of in the, the health side uh, of the White House. So this was somebody who was very attuned to what was happening in China because that is his focus.
Mm. Uh, ben, let me ask you about uh, Iowa and Nebraska, two states that have yet to issue stay-at-home orders. The governors of those states said they had a conversation with Dr. Anthony Fauci yesterday. Fauci has advocated for a national stay-at-home order. What are the governors saying about their conversation? Well, interestingly enough, after that conversation, the governors came out and said, we're all on the same page. This really isn't a problem, which to us seemed curious because for weeks now, Anthony Fauci has been saying he really wishes we had a nationwide stay-at-home order and that all these governors should get with the program and do that. But then Dr. Fauci was asked about it at the press briefing, and he said, you know what, after talking to these governors, what they are doing on the ground in their states and how people are responding is functionally equivalent to a stay-at-home order. They might not be calling it that, but but he says, in, at least in those two states, and those are the only two governors that he says he talked to, that he feels confident what they're doing uh, is sufficient at this point. But there are about seven states left that have no uh, stay-at-home order, uh, and, and Fauci does say he thinks it would be better off if everyone had one, but he's comfortable that what's happening in those two states in particular uh, it is enough. Hmm. Uh, I want to ask you about another conversation between President Trump and uh, Democratic candidate and former Vice President Joe Biden. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, so this is interesting, the coronavirus bringing people together on a phone call you would not normally expect to have a phone call. So apparently the president and Joe Biden, the former vice president, did speak on the phone yesterday about the federal response to coronavirus. Neither side is providing many details. The president said that the two of them agreed not to share publicly what they talked about. But the president said that uh, the former vice president did offer up some of his thoughts and opinions on how the federal government should respond. Interestingly enough, President Trump described it as a warm and wonderful call. And he said, I've always thought Joe Biden is a very nice man. He's a very nice man. So uh, he also did not use the phrase sleepy Joe Biden when he was talking about him here at the White House yesterday. There is some good news after all. Uh, ben, let me ask you, uh, over the past few days, uh, we've been following the story of a naval captain who was removed from his post for a letter about COVID-19 on his ship that leaked to the media. Uh, we've had comments from the Secretary of the Navy, who has since backtracked those comments. Uh, take us through exactly what happened, what the Secretary of the Navy said, and how the White House is weighing in now. Yeah, so this has been quite the saga. So after uh, the captain of that ship, Brett Crocher, was fired uh, last week, he, when he left the ship, he got this round of applause, a uh, very vociferous round of applause, from uh, the crew on the ship. And then the acting secretary of the Navy went and addressed the crew over the PA system of the boat and really dumped on the former captain of this boat. He said that he thinks he was either too stupid or too naive to realize that if he wrote up a letter detailing the problems with this coronavirus outbreak on his ship, that that would not be leaked to the media. He went as far to say perhaps he did it on purpose. That did not go over well on the ship. And in this audio recording that was leaked, after he uses the words too naive or too stupid, you can actually hear one of the sailors yell out, what the F, uh, really questioning why is he saying this and you know, really misreading the audience there on the ship. You can hear at another point, another sailor says he was just trying to protect us. So clearly that did not go over well. Uh, then the president was asked about it here at the White House, and the president even said, those were some pretty rough comments. I might have to get involved here and see see what's going on. He said, I've heard this captain was a really good guy, and I don't want somebody's career destroyed for one bad day. So after that, then just uh, a couple of hours later, we get this apology from the acting secretary of the Navy saying, indeed, he does not think Captain Crocher is naive or stupid, and really backtracking on what he said. So, so, Ben, I know we got to uh, wrap up soon, but let me ask you, do you think that uh, the acting Navy secretary's job at the moment is safe? It's hard to tell. I mean, clearly the president was not happy with what he heard that the acting secretary of the Navy said. Uh, the president didn't come out and criticize him directly, but he did call it a rough statement, tough words, saying, you know, this is hard for somebody's family to hear. I'm going to get involved in this. So I think once the acting secretary of the Navy heard the president say, I'm going to get involved here and see if this is really what's supposed to be happening, I'm sure he got the message pretty quickly that it was time to apologize. All right, Ben Tracy for us at the White House. Ben, as always, we thank you, my friend. Appreciate it. Thank you. Turning out of Michigan, where two of the state's largest hospital systems report thousands of healthcare workers are suffering from symptoms of COVID-19. Between Henry Ford and Beaumont Health, 
at least 2,200 employees, including 500 nurses, have either tested positive for or have symptoms of coronavirus. It is not clear whether employees contracted the virus while at work or through community spread. In a statement to CBS News, Beaumont Health said it is following CDC guidelines and asking employees who are unwell or have COVID-19 symptoms to stay at home for at least a week where they will continue to be paid. As of this morning, there are over 17,000 confirmed cases statewide and at least 727 people have died. Oklahoma will immediately resume most abortion procedures. That's after a federal judge lifted that state's temporary ban on the procedure. The ruling comes in response to the state's ban on all non-essential procedures, including abortions, because of the pandemic. In a statement, the judge argued the abortion ban caused an undue burden on women. He went on to say that the state acted in a, quote, unreasonable, arbitrary and, opp and oppressive way when imposing the ban. Turning now to the 2020 race, civil rights icon and Democratic Congressman John Lewis has endorsed former Vice President Joe Biden. The news comes as voters in Wisconsin head to the polls for today's still scheduled Democratic primary. Social distancing will be in effect at polling stations, but the state's Democratic governor says Republicans are forcing people to choose between their health and their right to vote. Ed O'Keefe explains. It's not just a presidential primary on the ballot today. There are hundreds of local elections in a competitive state Supreme Court race. And what's going on in this key battleground state of Wisconsin could be a preview of the court fights to come between Democrats and Republicans nationwide over how to vote amid a pandemic. Wisconsin is under a stay-at-home order, and the Democratic Governor Tony Evers has asked the Republican-led legislature to reschedule the primary until early June out of safety precautions, but GOP leaders and eventually the state Supreme Court refused. And last night, the U.S. Supreme Court also struck down a plan to allow absentee ballots to be accepted through next Monday. They must be put in the mail by today, but results of today's votes won't be posted until Monday, April 13th. All four of the court's liberal members dissented. Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg said voters will either, quote, have to brave the polls, endangering their own and other safety, or they'll lose the right to vote. Senator Bernie Sanders called this decision potentially deadly, but he trails former Vice President Joe Biden in polls in Wisconsin by wide margins. He also trails by hundreds of delegates in the race to be the Democratic presidential nominee. Despite that, there are no signs yet that Sanders plans to drop out of the presidential race. Anne-Marie and Vlad? Well, funeral homes across the country are definitely feeling the pressure as the coronavirus spreads. In the epicenter, New York City, there is a backlog of bodies. So one of our reporters, Graham Cates, actually spoke to funeral directors in New York City to find out how they are coping. What are they doing to help those who have lost loved ones? We're going to talk with him after the break. So stick around. You are streaming CBSN, CBS News, always on. You can watch CBSN 24 7. We've got an amazing story to share with you. Let's talk about the latest developments. There's so many levels to this. We have a CBS News exclusive. Fires in California. What happens next and how does it all play out? We are on a mission with NASA. I understand you have some breaking news. It's not over yet, is the bottom line. This is a massive operation. It's quite an adventure here at CBSN. It's been a day. Good morning to you and welcome to CBS This Morning. Understanding the world. We're going to begin with breaking news. Begins with the right questions. A police discovered a motive. Does the president have a red line here? What can voters are expect to see today? Join Gail King, Anthony Mason, and Tony DeCopel on CBS This Morning. We know a little more this morning. This is a major development. This is a very serious situation. More news every morning on the show everyone is talking about. We have much more news ahead for you. CBS This Morning.
British Prime Minister Boris Johnson is now in the ICU, and this comes two weeks after he was diagnosed with the coronavirus. He is 55 years old, and he was placed in intensive care last night after being hospitalized earlier this week. Downing Street says Johnson is not on a ventilator, but he is receiving oxygen treatment. Coronavirus cases in the UK have soared to nearly 52,000. More than 5,000 people have died as the country works to get the crisis under control. For more on this, let's bring in Elizabeth Palmer. She is joining us now from London. So, Liz, uh, what is the latest on the PM's conditions? Officials have said his symptoms have worsened over the past few days, or have they said that? They said when he was moved to the ICU uh, yesterday that uh, his doctors had advised that because it, his condition had worsened. They didn't specify, but we can uh, infer that he was having breathing difficulties. Now, we know that he's not on a ventilator, uh, but he apparently was moved into the ICU in case he needed a ventilator. So then what about the work of running the country? Is he able to do his job from the ICU? He formally handed over the key decisions to the Foreign Secretary, Dominic Raab. Uh, there is no such thing as a Deputy Prime Minister's job or role in the UK government. Uh, and so for the foreseeable future, Mr. Raab will chair the meetings, but the Cabinet will operate uh, on consensus or at least uh, make decisions as a result of discussion. Uh, that will get us through, I suppose, everybody Everybody's wondering when the big decision comes, and the one that's looming is how do we get out of this lockdown? What's the exit strategy? Um, it would be much preferable to have Mr. Johnson uh, back in, in, in form enough, well enough to participate. But of course, nobody knows exactly uh, how this is going to go. Liz, I note that the uh, Queen, when she delivered her very inspirational uh, speech to uh, the United Kingdom, um, that it was just an hour after the Queen's speech that the news came of the PM's predicament. And I wonder, uh, what are you hearing about whether or not the Cabinet was informed that Boris Johnson was being moved to intensive care? Uh, the Queen's speech, I should just say, was recorded several days beforehand. So um, oh, I, I don't think we I can assume that. that the Queen wasn't told. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, but yes, the, the Cabinet w was given the bare bones uh, of, of the news that he had worsened and he was going into intensive care. Um, and they, it's, it's interesting, they've underplayed the seriousness of Mr. Johnson's condition uh, all last week. And he himself made a couple of Twitter videos where he didn't look well, but he was obviously well enough to speak to the country and say, look, you know, stay the course, this is working, the lockdown's working, and so on. Um, and then when he was sent to hospital, it was described as a precautionary measure. So uh, they, they, they were trying not to alarm people, which is understandable. But some of the critics here have been saying, listen, uh, you, you missed an opportunity to say everybody in this country, no matter who uh, you are, is susceptible. Look, it's happened to the prime minister. He's seriously ill. He's in the hospital. This is the time for all of you to bear down and really cooperate because this disease uh, doesn't discriminate in the long run. Uh, it, it will be very interesting in the briefing this afternoon. They have regular briefings in the afternoon or where one or other of the cabinet uh, members speak, whether there'll be a a step change in tone, uh, because it's, it's, it's clearly very worrisome that Mr. Johnson has ended up in the critical care unit. It um, is indeed. And when it comes to uh, the UK... Us, uh, um, sorry, sorry, Liz. Sorry, Henry, Glad. Um, Liz, when it comes to the UK response to the coronavirus, give us a bit of a snapshot. You know, here in the U.S., we're still dealing with some shortages when it comes to um, protective gear, concerns about ventilators, whether or not there will be enough once this country reaches the APEC, and, of course, concerns about testing. What's going on uh, in the U.K.? 
we're under, a, you might call it a liberal lockdown. So people are out and about, as you can see, it's glorious spring weather. People are out exercising, they're allowed to walk around, they can go to the grocery stores and the pharmacies. Um, and that does seem to be working. It looked as if the number of deaths was plateauing. And over the weekend, there was a drop. So everybody got their hopes up. However, it seems to have been a, a glitch. Today's numbers are about as bad as last week's, uh, kind of 700 and a half deaths today. Uh, so it may be leveling, but it's still, it's still rising. Uh, the, at the very beginning, the, the British government was trying to identify every single uh, person with symptoms and do the contact tracing that's been so successful in South Korea. But they lost control of it very quickly. And since then, they've only been uh, testing people who have been uh, brought to hospital. They, they, there's clearly a, a huge shortage of reliable test kits, although they do say they'll be testing 100,000 people uh, a day by the end of the month, although by then we may be over the worst of it. Uh, so they were pretty slow off the mark. Um, as for ventilators and hospital capacity, the news there is much better. Uh, there was, uh, there were these pop-up emergency hospitals built here, as I know you've had in the United States. And so far, uh, there are many empty beds in those. So it doesn't look as if the critical care facilities will be overwhelmed, at least not yet. And as for ventilators, there's a shortage. But the mood music from the uh, medical officer is that they think they'll be able to meet the need as it grows. Uh, as for peak, they were thinking maybe this uh, over Easter weekend, but of course, uh, it's been pre unpredictable and the results have been disappointing time after time so nobody's guessing just quietly hoping hmm. all right uh, Liz thank you very very much for for that update and of course uh, we are are thinking uh, uh, sending positive energy to the PM there and also for the note on Queen Elizabeth who to thunk it there is magic in television we can record things before they actually air <laughs> we appreciate it as always Liz Japan has declared a state of emergency over the coronavirus pandemic that is set to last for at least a month. This comes as hospitals in some of the country's biggest cities start to fill up with patients battling the virus. There's nearly 4,000 confirmed cases in Japan and more than 91 people have died. Ramiro Nascencio is following the latest in Tokyo. Life will only change here in Japan as much as its citizens will actually follow that state of emergency declaration. That's because it doesn't allow for the kind of forced lockdowns we've seen in many countries from China, India, the Philippines, France and Italy. It does empower local governments to demand their citizens to stay home, but there still is no legal standing to really force them to stay inside. So Tokyo streets, along with several other prefectures under this declaration, could still see many people People walking around as well as many cars still on those roads. Now under that declaration businesses and venues can be asked to close too, like department stores, movie theaters and sports stadiums. Of course the more that are closed the less reason people have to be out. Services considered essential though those will stay open. Now that includes supermarkets, pharmacies and public transport but those could run on limited schedules. The government can also seize land to set up emergency medical facilities, and it could seize medical supplies like masks if they deem that necessary. Now, geographically, this current declaration doesn't apply to all of Japan. It does affect Tokyo and three surrounding prefectures. You can think of them as jurisdictions similar to U.S. states. An estimated 35 million people fall under that. That means about one out of four people in Japan are affected. And by the way, an interesting technological note about adapting to life here. It's spring graduation season and one university used remote controlled robots. That's right, robots that let students graduate from the safe and social distance of their homes. Those avatars were dressed in caps and gowns and each robot had a tablet, of course, with each of the students' faces. But the anxiety is real and rising, and on Twitter, the phrase escape from Tokyo was trending today. The government has asked people to stay where they are to try to stop the infection from spreading, but because of the nature of that state of emergency declaration, they can only ask. Ramey Innocencio, CBS News, Tokyo.
A strict lockdown is underway in Israel ahead of Passover. This is a holy week for both Jews and Christians. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu announced tough restrictions on public movement and travel between cities until Friday morning. The Jewish holiday, which is observed over the course of a week, begins tomorrow evening. And officials fear people will still hold customary large gatherings despite the growing virus threat. Uh, Lockdowns, tough lockdowns have been in place in ultra orthodox communities where case numbers have spiked. Israel's military is also helping enforce the new restrictions. Italy is seeing signs of progress as the country works to crack down on the coronavirus. Officials reported the smallest day to day increase in cases yesterday with nearly 3,600 new infections. More than 16,000 people have died from the virus across the country, but new reports suggest that number may be underestimated. Chris Livesay takes a closer look at the conditions in the northern part of Italy. Victim after victim, 33 at this nursing home. Agnese Magoni, a housekeeper who loved walks in the garden. Giulio Bonomi, a carpenter and bookworm. These are the empty beds that used to belong to patients who died of COVID-19, doctors say. But the unnerving thing is that they weren't tested before they died, so they don't appear in the official number of COVID-19 deaths in Italy. The virus struck so hard and so fast, they never made it to a hospital. And it's only those who die in hospitals that are counted in the national tally. Even authorities acknowledge the actual death toll may be much higher. You called it a tsunami. <laughs> tsunami. <laughs> a tsunami that killed three residents per day at its peak, says Dr. Barbara Kodali, and could still strike the 52 surviving residents. But have they been tested? No, and neither have we, she tells me. I might have COVID too. Two coworkers have died and many others are homesick. And it's at home where untold victims also die, untested and uncounted, like Alessandro Boromelli. Police are quick to collect his oxygen tanks, now in short supply. This disease is wiping out the generation that built everything around us, says his son. Were you or your father or anyone at your home tested for COVID-19? Voi avete fatto il tampone per sicurezza? No. No. Underreporting the number of dead is common even in Nembro, a town which already has the highest per capita death rate in the country. We spoke to the mayor, who crunched the numbers. So, what's the death toll? According to our analysis, it's four times higher. Most deaths simply aren't counted, he says. But the families and friends left behind believe every life matters and needs to be remembered. Cardinal George Pell is free from prison after Australia's highest court overturned his historic sex abuse conviction. The high court saying in part reasonable doubt should have been considered during the appeal. Now, the former Vatican treasurer was released yesterday. The ruling ends a five-year legal battle that started when a man accused Pell of abusing him as a child in the mid-1990s. As part of the decision, the cardinal's name will be removed from Australia's child sex offender register. Pell was the highest ranking Catholic official to ever be publicly accused of sexually abusing children. Under Australian law, the ruling cannot be challenged. Stephanie Grisham has stepped down as White House press secretary. Grisham will return to the First Lady's office, serving as Melania Trump's chief of staff and spokesperson, effective immediately. Now, she ever held a formal press briefing during her nine months as press secretary. And CBS News has confirmed that Kayleigh McEnany will take over as the press secretary. Coming up after the break, tens of thousands of coronavirus tests are going on process as labs struggle to keep up with demand. We're gonna tell you what that means for those still waiting for answers. Stay with us, you're streaming CBS and CBS News, always on. You can watch CBSN 24 7. We've got an amazing story to share with you. Let's talk about the latest developments. There's so many levels to this. We have a CBS News exclusive. Fires in California. What happens next and how does it all play out? 
We are on a mission with NASA. I understand you have some breaking news. It's not over yet is the bottom line. This is a massive operation. It's quite an adventure here at CBSN. It's been a day. Good morning to you and welcome to CBS This Morning. Understanding the world. We're going to begin with breaking news. Begins with the right questions. Have police discovered a motive? Does the president have a red line here? What can voters are expect to see today? Join Gail King, Anthony Mason, and Tony DeCopel on CBS This Morning. We know a little more this morning. This is a major development. This is a very serious situation. More news every morning on the show everyone is talking about. We have much more news ahead for you. CBS This Morning. industry is struggling to keep up with the rapidly increasing death toll caused by the coronavirus pandemic. Already, around 11,000 people have died from the virus in the United States, and tens of thousands more lives are projected to be lost. The numbers have created an unprecedented bottleneck at morgues, funeral homes, and cemeteries. And Graham Kate spoke to several funeral directors in New York City, which is the epicenter uh, of this outbreak here in the U.S. And Graham, you're joining us now. You know, Graham, I remember, I think maybe it was last week or a week ago, the president talking about uh, Elmer's Hospital in Queens that he was really familiar with. And he saw a video of what he described as body bags uh, lying in the hallway and uh, freezer trucks coming in because of a morgue overflow. And you could really tell that he was rattled by those images. But after those body bags leave the hospital, they have to go to area morgues, they have to go to area funeral homes. How are morgues and funeral homes in New York coping? They're overflowing. Think of funeral directors as the end of the front line in terms of those who have to directly interact with people who have caught the virus and who could still potentially pass it on through like respiratory microbes. Uh, and they're saying we have more cases than we can handle. And just like in the hospitals, we're running short on personal protective equipment. And and, and they point out, you know, funeral directors are, are going to be the last in the line of those frontline workers to get that equipment because it's so important to get it to medical workers first. Hmm. Uh, and Graham, uh, funeral homes are also enforcing social distancing. How is that changing the nature of what they do? One said to me that the business model has completely changed. Uh, in many cases, the bodies are going straight to a crematorium or straight to a grave without there being any chance for loved ones to be able to go and pay their respects in the way we think of, like standing in front of a casket and, and taking the time there. And then in other cases, when there is able to be a service at a funeral home, um, there are these kind of strict rules that have been put into place. Maybe it's shifts, so four or five people can come at a time, and then the next four or five people. And it all has to be very orderly um, and very supervised. And then, of course, there are, there are virtual services, so that's people gathering over Zoom or FaceTime, but not getting to do that personal uh, uh, service that, that we're used to seeing. And for the funeral directors, they said that's actually really hard. They, they, they pride themselves. You don't get into the the funeral business if you're not trying to give people like a really good chance to grieve in the way that we've come to expect. And right now they have to say to people, we can't do it the way maybe you expected to be able to do it for this person or that person may have hoped to have had, but we have to make the best of it right now. Yeah, I think it's a really good point to bring up, Graham, that for funeral directors, you know, sort of managing and taking care of the body is one thing, but they also really, really focus on being supportive, of being honorable, of, of sort of stepping in when, you know, perhaps a family is falling apart and being a steadying, stabilizing force. And I and much of that has to do with probably, you know, sort of being intimate, touching someone, hugging them when they need a hug, giving them a handkerchief when they're crying, and they can't do any of that. 
stuff. And then there is just sort of the basic kind of, um, uh, um, like I said, managing the bodies, but sort of the basic things that you need to do, like finding a place for the body to go. Cemetery plots. Are there enough cemetery plots? So I don't actually have a number on the number of cemetery plots in New York, but what we do know is that they're coming in so fast that yesterday, for instance, they were talking about well, we have to create temporary internment sites. And there was some argument between officials about whether that'll happen. New York City actually has an island that over, over the course of about two centuries, they've used as like a potter's field. And this would be the first time that um, it's not just for like unidentified people. They would be talking about using that for just the overflow of bodies. And of course, there's been some argument about whether or not the city's actually considering that. But you did have multiple officials um, saying that, look, in, in the long run, this is a plan that we've always had and we've just never actually had to implement before. And then when you talk about for where there are funeral services, these guys are all exhausted. They're saying, we're not even sleeping because it's just funeral after funeral after funeral. And we want to make sure that we can do it as right as we can. And that takes time. Let me ask you, Gran, uh, where are, I mean, funeral directors, uh, people who work at morgues, they are essential services, but where are they in the line to receive protective gear? They say they're at the end of the line, and they say they understand that, right? I, I spoke to the uh, president of the New York State Funeral Directors Association, and he said, I understand that hospital workers and medical employees need the PPE, the personal protective equipment, and he, but he said, we need it too. And we're the last ones to get it. And every to a T, every funeral director that I spoke to said, I still have some supplies, but I am running low and I can't figure out where I'm going to get the next shipment. You contact the places that sell them and they say you're now on the list, but there's no estimate for when you might get it. And, and they're kind of relying on their state association to figure out where to get a very large supply of masks and gloves and, and all the, the equipment you see medical personnel wear. And he told me, you know, I, even my normal uh, suppliers are saying, you're not, you're not the, the main priority right now. Wow. Well, Graham, thank you so much. There's so many different ways that this virus uh, impacts the way we live, things that we have taken for granted before. Um, really appreciate your reporting. Thanks. Thank you. So... So the U.S. Surgeon General says that efforts to flatten the curve appear to be making a difference. He's talking about social distancing. He insists it is still very, very crucial and important. And he also says that the country needs to do a much better job when it comes to testing. Uh, Dr. Jerome Adams spoke about this on CBS This Morning. I started off the week uh, telling Americans that this was going to be a really rough week, but I also wanted Americans to understand that when we've dealt with tough times in the past, the country has rallied. And, and what we're seeing now is the country is rallying. We're seeing New York and New Jersey uh, have hospitalizations level off and start to come down. Deaths are starting to uh, slow down and level off. And that's important because it tells us mitigation is working. It tells us what the American people are doing by staying at home by social distancing, by practicing good hygiene, and the 30-day guidelines for America are actually effective, and they will help us get through to the other side of this unfortunate tragedy. Dr. Adams, how, how can we be sure that mitigation is working as well as we hope it to be working when we don't know, to put it plainly, how many Americans actually have this virus because we don't have widespread testing? So to put it more bluntly, how do we know when we're in the clear and we can get back to normal if we don't know how widespread this is? Well, th there are two questions in there, and I'll quickly unpack both of them. The most important thing is that we know mitigation is working because when we look at the curves of Washington and California, we see that they've been very flat, and that's coincident with them instituting aggressive mitigation. We see Italy and Spain uh, down on the downslopes of their curves, coincident with them starting mitigation. So we know mitigation is working. Now, you mentioned testing. Testing is a concern. Uh, we are going to be at 2 million tests this week, and it's rapidly ramping up with the commercial industry coming on board. We're also seeing more people doing antibody testing. So what I want the American people to know is I've talked with Admiral Jawai. I speak with him every day. He's our testing czar. And he assures me that by the end of this month, we should be uh, not only just doing diagnostic testing, but also having good surveillance testing 
across the country. Uh, at 2 million people by the end of this week, we're getting really close to South Korea's initial testing surge numbers. And we are, in fact, doing surveillance testing in some parts of the country uh, where they haven't seen a big increase in cases. So uh, we're not there and, yet, but we are moving in course, the right direction. And of course, that surveillance testing is so important. I want to touch on another point of concern, and that is the, the death rate among African Americans. In Louisiana, mm -hmm. we heard the governor say 70% of the fatalities are people of color. In Chicago, we heard the mayor say more than 70% in that city. Uh, your response to that, and should the CDC or the federal government be tracking this virus demographically to warn people? Well, Absolutely. Uh, the CDC and the federal government should be and are tracking this virus and trying to break it down by different demographic groups so that we can help people understand. But my office, long before COVID-19, has been talking about health equity, has been talking about the need to help people understand when they're at risk and to actually intervene. And when you look at being black in America, number one, uh, people, unfortunately, are more likely to be of low socioeconomic status which makes it harder to social distance. Number two, we know that blacks are more likely to have diabetes, heart disease, lung disease. And I've shared myself personally that I have high blood pressure, that I have heart disease and spent a week in the ICU due to a heart condition that I actually have asthma and I'm pre-diabetic. And so I represent that legacy of growing up poor and black in America. And I and many black Americans are at higher risk for COVID. It's why we need everyone to so do their part to slow the spread. So, Doctor, I imagine that it's, it's frustrating for you to hear those numbers, 70 percent of the dead in Louisiana, people of color, African Americans. Is there a particular recommendation heart. you have for that community? Well, my recommendation... Heart. My recommendation is to understand that you are at risk, you are not immune, and, and my recommendation is to all of America that we're really doing this to protect not just ourselves but each other. Every single person who stays at home, whether you're white, black, brown, or yellow, is a person who is not spreading COVID and is a person who can protect their neighbors. When you wear a cloth facial covering, if you go outside, you're doing it to protect your neighbor. Now's, now's really the time for us to come together and say, look, uh, I'm doing this not just for me and my family, but I'm doing this for my community and all the communities across the country. And it is working. We will get through this. We are seeing progress. But America has the power to change the trajectory of this epidemic. The public really needs to keep doing their part. America's top doctor there. For more interviews like this, stream CBS This Morning weekdays at 7 Eastern right here on CBSN. The health minister of, uh, the health of British Prime Minister, rather, Boris Johnson has taken a turn for the worse as he continues to battle COVID-19. We're going to have the latest on his condition after a short break. Keep it right here. You're streaming CBSN. You can watch CBSN 24 7. We've got an amazing story to share with you. Let's talk about the latest developments. There's so many levels to this. We have a CBS News exclusive. Fires in California. What happens next and how does it all play out? We are on a mission with NASA. I understand you have some breaking news. It's not over yet, is the bottom line. This is a massive operation. It's quite an adventure here at CBSN. It's been a day. Good morning to you and welcome to CBS This Morning. Understanding the world. We're going to begin with breaking news. Begins with the right questions. Have police discovered a motive? Does the president have a red line here? What can voters here expect to see today? Join Gail King, Anthony Mason, and Tony DeCopel on CBS This Morning. We know a little more this morning. This is a major development. This is a very serious situation. More news every morning on the show everyone is talking about. We have much more news ahead for you. CBS This Morning.
So commercial labs are struggling to keep up with the increased demand for more coronavirus testing. Uh, many states have a sort of uh, increased their uh, testing throughout the entire state. Meanwhile, there's a backlog. There are tens of thousands of tests that have already been conducted and people are waiting for the results. And hospitals say that this is wasting precious resources. Jerika Duncan has more on that. I think you, you want to know what's going on with your body um, and then what you might be facing, you know, further ahead. Mike Hoffer says he was left without answers for eight days after taking a COVID-19 test. So you're in this constant worry of, you know, is, you know, he going to wake up in the morning? Is he going to wake up in the middle of the night gasping for air? His wife, Lisa, said the lack of information also left friends and family wondering if they were exposed in the meantime. Not only can we not get answers, but we can't give answers to our employers, to our friends, to our family, people that we had been around in the couple weeks before. Mike's test was administered by his local urgent care. But even national groups like LabCorp are reporting turnaround times of four to five days. And Quest Diagnostics tell CBS this morning it is still working to clear 80,000 tests from its backlog. That's down from 160,000 tests nearly two weeks ago. Should the private laboratories be doing more? I think everybody needs to be doing more. And, and private labs are a part of the solution. Uh, my sense is that they are working as, as hard as they can. Dr. Ashish Jha is the director of the Harvard Global Health Institute. Without testing, you don't know how much disease there is. You can't uh, isolate people who are infected. You can't make treatment plans for people who are infected. Hospital officials say testing also helps them manage resources like bed availability and personal protective equipment, or PPE. When it comes down to lab testing, turnaround time is PPE. Dr. Jeff Baird is the acting chair of laboratory medicine at UW Medicine in Seattle. He says the hospital's in-house testing can process results within hours, which helps them save valuable resources. For the hospitalized patient or the patient evaluated in an emergency room or a clinic, we need to treat all of those patients when they come in as if they had it, because if they do, we need to be protected. And if they don't, we can then relax our PPE standards and treat them in a more appropriate way. But it's not just private companies struggling to keep up. As of Sunday, more than 14,000 people in California are awaiting test results from both private and public health labs. Many other states have yet to report specific numbers on testing backlogs. Inconsistencies between states inspired the COVID tracking project, which collects all the data state by state in one place. Alexis Madrigal, a writer for The Atlantic, is a co-founder. We feel like if you're part of the national response to this epidemic, then you owe the nation transparency. What we need from them is not perfection, but transparency, honesty, and openness. All right, let's bring in Jerika Duncan now to talk about this. So Jerika, clearly it looks like we have a lot of work to do when it comes to getting the results of these tests. What are commercial labs saying about the backlog? Well, they're saying that they have increased their testing capacity. And I think when you look back at these two main companies that we looked at with Quest and LabCorp, which uh, total right now have performed uh, over a million tests, they were sort of the first ones out the gate uh, that first week in March. March 5th, March 9th is when those companies started testing. And I think there was such an influx that they didn't realize uh, the amount of testing material that it was going to take. and that they, in fact, weren't going to be able to perform all these tests within those, you know, five to seven days that they were saying in the beginning. Then it's now four to five days on average to get the results. Um, but after this story first aired on CBS this morning, I've received a, a few uh, tweets from people saying, my result took two weeks. Someone said their result took three weeks. Um, I have a close friend of mine whose sister, she said, uh, is still waiting for her results. So, you're going to find places and people all across this country who are waiting for the results. Um, and the problem with that is twofold. It's peace of mind and not knowing because you could then be spreading it or infecting other people or you start to question who, my, who I may have been in contact with. Um, and then, of course, you know, the more knowledge we know about who's infected, the better we can treat it. Although many doctors will tell you that the treatment plan doesn't change, even when people uh, are positive for COVID-19, a doctor generally will tell you to stay home and self-quarantine 
of course, unless you're having respiratory problems. Uh, I personally have uh, experience with that. I was not able to get a test, but I know that um, due to the shortage of tests, uh, they're, they're telling people, of course, to go home and quarantine, especially here in New York City. Um, but they are getting a handle on the backlog. I think it was just a matter, again, of in the beginning, not realizing just how many tests that they were going to be expected to perform in a short amount of time. So, Jerika, what about the gentleman in the beginning of your story, Mike Hoffer? Did he ever actually get his results? That's a great question. Um, he did get his results, and he tested negative. But a day after getting the results, his symptoms got worse. He had a tough time breathing. He actually went to the hospital, and then they decided to test him there again, and he tested positive. Uh, so that becomes a separate story of people who get a test, and in fact, they do have coronavirus, um, but maybe it's a false negative test. Um, so I'm sure we'll be, you know, looking into that more. But uh, he did test negative on that first one, and again, went back to get treatment. The hospital tested him, and he did, in fact, have coronavirus. But as you saw in the piece, he's doing much better now. And well, what was his family's reaction news, once but... they got the test back? Sorry, Emery. Uh, say that again, Vlad. That's okay. <laughs> Sorry, there's a delay. Um, I just wanted to know what his family, what his family had to say about the 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 results of the test when they got that back. Well, at first, it was sort of a relief. Again, it's that idea of a peace peace of mind. But then it's like you have to listen to your body and pay attention to those symptoms that we keep hearing about. Um, and then, of course, to find out that your relative does, in fact, have coronavirus, well, then everyone in the family who's been in contact with him and his immediate family was naturally concerned. Um, as far as we know, everyone is fine right now. But then, you know, what's so tricky about coronavirus is you could not show symptoms for days at a time, or you could have someone in your household that does have symptoms and other people um, do have symptoms or they don't have symptoms and then you have symptoms. So I think it just depends, but the family's doing well, uh, but without a doubt, it was frustrating for them in the beginning to not know, then to find out, only to find out that in fact, uh, Mr. Hoffer did have coronavirus. Um, I hope you get an opportunity to sort of follow up on that second story that you were talking about, which is this, you know, false negative yeah. or maybe I mean, maybe when he tested weeks and weeks ago, he didn't have it. But in the meantime, he picked it up. Um, I think that's a really, really interesting story. I can't imagine how nerve wracking it is for his family. Adrika, thank you so much for talking with us. Yeah, it's one we're working on. So stay tuned. Good, good. So in the meantime, a New York doctor is hoping that her very creative video will give people a sense of just how quickly the coronavirus can spread. Um, Jenna DeAngelis from our CBS New York station, WCBS, reports on that. Person comes into an office or into your home, this is what happens. Using props at Long Island office, ageless MD, Dr. Roxanne Carfora walks us through just how fast the coronavirus can spread. The person sneezes all over the place. There are virons. This is COVID on the floor. Latching onto anything it can, from someone's credit card to their drink, the floor, and the next person who walks in. There's a COVID-19 on my shoe. And tracking it through your house, it gets on the surface and then it, it's waiting for the next body to come and inhale it. That's where she says disinfecting your shoes, cleaning surfaces, and of course constantly washing your hands comes in. We have to starve this virus and the only way to starve it is staying home. Dr. Carfora, who is board certified in anti-aging and regenerative medicine, is trying to stress to the younger population. If it's not about you, it's about grandma, grandpa, and your parents. I lost two patients, 188 and 184, very, very fast. Demonstrating in another Facebook video how the aging cell gets attacked, this time using eggs. This is a young cell here. You see the yolk is the inside of the cell. The outside of the cell is called the lipid layer. Every single cell in your body has a lipid layer to protect you. A younger cell has that protection. An older cell, if you look at this yolk, doesn't have that protection. So look what happens already. Cobra goes in there and it destroys the cell. 
She's hoping her two videos will send one main message. Work together on this. It's everyone's responsibility. To stop the spread by staying home. Jenna DeAngelis, CBS 2 News. So that video almost reminds me a little bit of, do uh, you remember the uh, the war on drugs video where, you know, this is your brain, this is your brain on drugs with a frying pan? Like, there's something about an egg in a frying pan. It's very, very vivid. Uh, hopefully, people um, get get the message. Um, in the meantime, we've got some breaking news for you. I remember my parents you. playing That's that Stephanie video Christian. for me often. Right, right. I'm sure it worked, right? Uh, clean and sober. Um, yeah, so we've got some breaking news for you. Uh, Stephanie Grisham has stepped down as the White House press secretary. We just found out about this today. The news comes as President Trump's new chief of staff reorganizes the staff uh, in parts of the West Wing. Now, Grisham will return to the First Lady's office, serving as Melania Trump's chief of staff and spokesperson, effective immediately. In a press release from the First Lady's office, uh, uh, Grisham said that her White House replacement will be announced in the coming days. Uh, so we, we sort of caught a little bit of wind of this, Vlad, I think earlier this week. And in fact, I think some reporters called Grisham at home. She was under quarantine and asked her if it was true. And she said uh, she hadn't heard anything at all. But after all, she was under quarantine. Turns out the news was true. Yeah, and Marie, and I, and I you know, um, I'm pretty certain, too, that uh, that Stephanie Grisham never held an actual formal press briefing. So uh, I'd have to be fact checked on hmm. the historical antecedents. But I, I would think that this would make her the only White House press secretary in modern times who had not held a formal press briefing. I could be wrong about that. But, you know, there have been so many things that have occurred over the last uh, couple of months. Uh, and yet, uh, as we know, the president of the United States has always said uh, and many believe that he is the best communicator as far as, uh, as, as the, his administration and his supporters think uh, that he is the one to most effectively communicate his message. But um, it is remarkable that she never actually held a formal press briefing. So the news, again, out of the White House uh, that CBS News has confirmed is that Stephanie Grisham will be returning uh, to the First Lady's office, and we will await to find out who the next press secretary uh, will be. Uh, still ahead here on CBSN, the latest on the coronavirus outbreak, uh, we're going to bring you live updates from across the country as officials respond to the growing pandemic. And if you haven't already done it, now's probably a really good time for you to download the free CBS News app. You can download it on all of your connected devices, and that means you can watch CBSN anytime, anywhere, on any device. The app is free. You can also head to our website. You can find that at cbsnews.com. We'll be right back. Understanding the world. We're going to begin with breaking news. Begins with the right questions. A police discovered a motive. Does the president have a red line here? What can voters are expect to see today? CBS This Morning. CBSN. Thanks for joining us. I'm Paula Eben. There is new hope that social distancing may be working in New York, the coronavirus epicenter in the U.S. Hospitalizations are down for another day, but new hotspots are emerging as the numbers nationwide continue to climb. There are more than 368,000 reported cases of the virus, and the death toll has reached more than 11,000 here in the U.S. Michael George has the latest. Military medical workers are treating coronavirus patients inside New York City's Javits Convention Center. We're mobilizing uh, in the same way that we mobilize to go to war. In this war with an invisible enemy, the New York Times reports it took a month for 5,000 people to die in the U.S., but then just five days for another 5,000 to die. 
more than 40 percent of the deaths have been in New York. But the governor says social distancing is working and has doubled the fines for people who get too close to people they don't live with. Right now we're projecting that we are uh, reaching a plateau in the total number of hospitalizations, and you can see the growth, and you see it starting to flatten. Field hospitals are now helping relieve the strain on New York's hospitals. A new one opens today here at the Billie Jean King Tennis Center, home of the U.S. Open. It has 350 beds for non-critical coronavirus patients. There are now at least 22 field hospitals open or about to open in 18 states, including this one going up inside Detroit's convention center. You're going to have some sick people here, and definitely those that need it, need help. In Louisiana, more than 1,800 new cases were reported Monday, bringing the total to nearly 15,000. Of the state's 512 deaths, 70% are African Americans. When you look at being black in America, number one, uh, people unfortunately are more likely to be of low socioeconomic status which makes it harder to social distance. Number two, we know that blacks are more likely to have diabetes, heart disease, lung disease. And in Wisconsin, social distancing voting. The presidential primary is taking place in the battleground state, despite Democratic efforts to delay it. The state's Democratic governor says Republican lawmakers are forcing people to choose between their health and their right to vote. Michael George, CBS News, New York. In the last few days, hospitalizations have stabilized in New York, but many cases could be going undetected. U.S. Surgeon General Jerome Adams addressed this concern on CBS This Morning. Dr. Adams, how, how can we be sure that mitigation is working as well as we hope it to be working when we don't know, to put it plainly, how many Americans actually have this virus because we don't have widespread testing? So to put it more bluntly, how do we know when we're in the clear and we can get back to normal if we don't know how widespread this is? Well, th there are two questions in there, and I'll quickly unpack both of them. The most important thing is that we know mitigation is working because when we look at the curves of Washington and California, we see that they've been very flat, and that's coincident with them instituting aggressive mitigation. We see Italy and Spain uh, down on the downslopes of their curves, coincident with them starting mitigation. So we know mitigation is working. Now, you mentioned testing. Testing is a concern. Uh, we are going to be at 2 million tests this week, and it's rapidly ramping up with the commercial industry coming on board. We're also seeing more people doing antibody testing. So what I want the American people to know is I've talked with Admiral Drouet. I speak with him every day. He's our testing czar. And he assures me that by the end of this month, we should be uh, not only just doing diagnostic testing,